Greetings everyone, Merry Christmas and Happy Holidays, and hope you had a great Christmas. Uh, welcome back to Patriot to the Core Podcast, I am Thad Forrester. Today we're going to be talking with my friend Roger Long. He is a um, Parkinson's, I'm not sure if you'd say survivor, I guess you'd call him a survivor. I mean, he's definitely been able to overcome and, and fight that disease and to be able to live a pretty normal life. Uh, I, met, I met Roger... Um, I was driving through a neighborhood as I was looking at houses in the neighborhood I currently live. And I saw this guy walking up one of the big hills in the neighborhood. And he's carrying a backpack. And it was in the wintertime, so he was dressed warm. And uh, clearly he wasn't like walking, um, like fast walking or anything for exercise that way. But I knew that this guy was, uh, I knew what he was doing because I did the same thing when I trained for my rucks. And so I ended up seeing him a little while later outside the house we were looking at. And... <laughs> And I walked straight up to him and just said, "Hey, are those are those Solomon shoes you're wearing?" <laughs> or I think I used a different uh, there was different brand shoes. But anyway, I kind of just went straight to his shoes without even introducing myself. So he and I started talking and became instant friends. Uh, he had a son in the Marines at the time and another one about to join. So um, want to talk about his his role as a father of Marines and then struggling with Parkinson's and how he's overcome it and used fitness to really to fight those symptoms and to, to walk normally and to, you know, he lost a lot of weight and he talks about how he can, um, he thinks what he's gone through has helped him relate to other veterans, especially his sons and his son, his oldest, who definitely served in, in uh, combat situations. And so uh, that helped him relate to his son as he got home and they spent a lot of time alone together, you know, and going on some expeditions. So, um, yeah, let's bring Roger in. Hey, so Roger, why don't you tell us about your life before your diagnosis with Parkinson's? Uh, it was the uh, typical American dream, pull yourself up by the bootstraps type story. You know, I'm the oldest of three brothers. Our, our dad left us when we were uh, young, you know, had to work hard, worked way through school. Um, married the love of my life. We had a couple of kids and, and got on with life. Yeah, because you, you um, had a nice house. I mean, I, I've... Yeah, I mean, we had we had basically accomplished what, you know, growing up as, as you know, both of us coming from the poor side, um, accomplished a great deal, you know, our educations and, and you know, finally bought that that house that, you know, you, you promise your wife you'll buy her someday and, and that we can raise our kids in and, and, uh, you know, had a good job, good destination job. And, you know, everything was going pretty well. When did you, how did you figure out something was wrong? And then how did you, you know, when did you get the diagnosis? Um, November 1st, uh, 2002, uh, when I got out of bed, my left leg wouldn't do what I wanted it to do and uh, drug it around over the course of a week and then got out of bed one morning a week after that first day and uh, neither leg worked. I was like glued to the floor and that was the beginning and, and it was pretty uh, evident that there was something major happening. Did you even know what kind of doctor to go to? Um, n Not at first. I mean, I, I thought maybe I'd pinched a nerve in my back or something, you know, that was affecting my legs. And so went to the, you know, a normal a general practitioner and they ran a bunch of tests and then passed me on to a neurologist who eventually passed me on to the, uh, the, uh, movement disorders, um, department at UAB Kirkland. So when you get the diagnosis, what do they tell you? I'm wondering, did it sound grim? And then how did you, how did you take it? Well, I mean, obviously it's, it's some major news when you get a, a diagnosis that you're, you have an incurable neurological disease and that it's only going to get worse. But as a person of faith, um, you know, from the get go, we believe that, you know, there's something good that has to come of it. And if we had known, you know, at, at, at our age that we were in our mid to early thirties, if we had really known what was coming, um, we probably would have been more scared, but at that point, you know, our naivete helped us as, as did our faith. So we just went headlong into it saying, you know, we'll deal with it as it happens. So what was going to be your, how were you 
told to deal with it? And then did you deal with the doctor said, or did you kind of come up with your own, you know, well, ways to deal, handle it? You know, this was 15 years ago. So 15 years ago in, in the treatment of Parkinson's disease and a lot of neurological diseases, it's based on the pharmacology. The, you know, here's your, uh, medicine cocktail to try and replace the chemical that's, that's missing from your brain. Um, that part of your brain that's making dopamine is dying. And so here's this cocktail of medicines that's supposed to try and replace that so that you can still function normally. Um, you know, I still have the same doctor that I, that originally diagnosed me there in Birmingham. And so basically, you know, it, the main thrust of treatment was, you know, me, uh, meds. You know, here's how we do this. You know, try and keep a positive attitude. Um, you know, the normal things that most doctors tell you eat right. You know, exercise wasn't really pointed out at the time as as being part of the treatment. But over time, it became evident that exercise was essential. That you know, in order to keep moving, I had to I had to keep moving. You know, it was like if I stopped, then it's like the Parkinson's catches up with me. So there's many research papers now and studies that have shown just how effective exercise is for Parkinson's. But it was kind of like I was learning that on my own early on. What kind of shape were you in physically when you got the diagnosis? I was in pretty good shape. I'd been, you know, making that. I think a lot of people in their mid thirties realize, Hey, you know, I need to do more. I, I can't just rely on being young. And so I had spent several months back in the gym and, and was, you know, strong as, as I'd ever been in my life, uh, even going back to high school when it was, uh, you know, training for football. And so I was in really good shape right when it hit. Hmm. And then, so your, your oldest son, I don't know how old he was at this time, but I know he went into the Marines. So what role did that play in your recovery? Well, to, uh, drop back just a little bit when he was 13 at the time I was diagnosed, but at 12, he was 12 when 9-11 happened. And so, you know, on September 10th, 2001, he was just a, a regular preteen who loved, you know, playing with other kids and his brother in the neighborhood. And on September 12th, as a 12 year old, the day after 9-11, he said, I'm going to the Marine Corps. And so, you know, you, you're like, well, that's very admirable, but who knew? at that point that that six years later when he turned 18 that we'd be in the middle of two wars and so uh but we supported him and that's what he decided to do and he never wavered and followed through on that by the way i've never asked you this what was it about the marines that he he locked in on them from the beginning he saw it as the hardest of the hard you know he he wanted to if he was going to do it he wanted to do the hardest thing he could possibly think of. And at 12 years old and, and you know what he heard from people and what he read on the internet, you know, the Marines was it. So that's what he set his mind for. They, and they were in the, in the thick of it, weren't they? Yeah. So fast forward at some point, uh, what, what happened with your health and, uh, you know, because of the, I don't know, maybe if it was all because of the Parkinson's or just because of, lack of exercise, and then, I don't know, what influence did your son, your oldest, first of all, I guess, have on you with, you know, recovery or with fighting it? Yeah, I mean, it was it was a constant fight the whole time he was basically a teenager and and when he first entered the Marine Corps, and, and it was, Parkinson's is progressive, and so I continued to worsen over time. So the Parkinson's worsened, and then, you know, you don't get exercise and you, you know, some of the meds cause you to gain weight and for some other people it causes them to lose weight. So it, it, there's, there's all these chemicals in your body now that's trying to help your brain that can have adverse effects, side effects. And so I was really in the worst physical shape I'd ever been in by the time he went into the Marine Corps. And so first he served in Iraq and then a couple of years later was, was when the real, uh, defining time came when he was um, 
in Afghanistan during the surge. And so uh, his unit, based out of Camp Lejeune, uh, suffered a lot of casualties, a lot, of, several KIA and, and a lot of wounded. And that led him one night to call me and, and say, Dad, I, I don't know, I don't think I'm going to make it out of here, so you need to start preparing yourself. And, you know, I can talk to you about this, but I can't talk to Mom about it. So it was it was basically like, hey, you need to prepare yourself that more than likely I'm not going to make it out of here. So considering the, the shape that I was in, um, he was being honest, and I felt great that he could talk to me about how he really felt. But that was probably one of the last things I needed um, from a from a mental health standpoint, from a health, you know, how to stress affect things. But it was it was that night in September of 2010 that that I basically, you know, was begging God for his life. You know, I'm like, my, my life really doesn't matter uh, anymore. Um, take me instead of him. And uh, God doesn't really bargain because we don't have anything to bargain with. But essentially what I got from that, that night of, of praying and, and begging for my son's life was that, that God wanted something from me. He wanted me to get up and walk. And to go to be able to meet my son and to be able to help him whenever he returned. So that was really the beginning of of what I call the recovery, you know, is, is starting with one step that has purpose. And at this time, so you were not working anymore at that time, right? No, I was medically retired. Okay. And at when he when he get, you got that phone call like you um you were that was probably one of the lowest points in your yeah. life is that right yeah yeah I think I've heard you describe it one time or maybe it was this is in your book where you said you were like you felt like you were at the bottom of a big hole at the bottom of a mountain something yeah. like that yeah that was that was where I found myself when I when I took those first steps um to learn how to walk again by that point I'd been reliant on a cane for a long time and a leg brace to uh, try and keep my my left leg straight, which um, Parkinson's is very one sided. So it was affecting my left side more so. And so when when I realized that, I, you know, that I had a purpose, it was I uh, put the cane down, took the leg brace off and and started um, literally learning how to walk on my own again. And that was that was really the beginning of when, after that first day of walking, that's when I realized where I was at the bottom of a hole at the bottom of a big mountain and knew that it was going to be a very um, difficult struggle, but at least it had an upward trajectory instead of, instead of feeling like I was continuing to spiral down like I had been for the previous eight years, it became, all right, there's a purpose here. And, you know, you, you take a step forward and, and you, you know that you're doing something with purpose. And that first day is when I realized where I was starting from. But as, as each day went by and I went back again and again to that trail that went around a small lake in our neighborhood, um, I, I begin to think of it as, as I'm walking with him on the opposite side of the world. You know, I think, uh, families, and especially parents and children have a kind of connection that is difficult to explain. And for me, I, I wanted by every step I took to meet him where he was going to be in the future. I wanted him to feel like I was with him wherever he was. Were you using a cane at first as you, when you walked around the lake and started walking? No, I, I put the cane away and just had to, start learning how to manage it. I'm sure I, I looked very odd, um, probably like a, a drunkard learning to or trying to get around. But, you know, as I continued to progress um, with consistency, it was like the brain began learning that there's a uh, there's a new way to do this. This we can't do this same action the same way that we did before. But we can learn how to do this a new way. And that was, that was really the beginning of what um, I've come to understand is what's called neuroplasticity. 
in that that our brains can learn to do things uh, in a new way to work around the damage or the diseased part of the brain. And that's a, that's a subject for a whole other time. But uh, it's very it's very promising to know that, that with the effort we can overcome uh, a brain injury or a or a brain disease. Hmm. What, so what was your plan when you started walking after you talked to your oldest? To be, to be whatever he needed me to be whenever he came home. And I didn't know if, if it was literally, you know, I just needed to be healthier and be able to have him lean on me or if literally we were going to have to walk somewhere together. And so it was just to, to prepare for whenever you know, and to give me hope too that he would come home. Hmm. I guess too. You know, you're out there, you're outside walking by yourself. That's really. I, I mean, I know it's physically therapeutic, but that gave you a lot of time to think. Well, yeah. I mean, I already had a lot of time to to think. Oh yeah, yeah. You know, over the years of being uh, after retiring and. You know, my wife's at work, my kids are at school and are away at the military and all my friends are at work. So I, I was used to spending a lot of time alone. But I think what what that time gave me was um, as my body was learning to move again, it also helped me pursue, you know, what is my purpose? You know, what is the good that's supposed to come from this this thing that has dominated my life for the past several years you know that that underlying faith that that there's something positive that has to come from this it has to it can't be just suffering for suffering's sake it has to have a purpose and that belief and that faith i think is what i concentrated on while i was learning to walk again so how did that go for you when you started walking what kind of goals like more measurable goals that you set and, you know, I don't know, how did you accomplish them? Well, as I, as I wrote about in the book, the, the first major goal was 10 miles in a day, you know, that to go from it being difficult to go two flights of stairs to being able to walk 10 miles in a day. And at that lake was a large rock formation. And, and I wanted to stand on that rock formation, but I wouldn't allow myself to do so until I reached 10 miles in a day. And so I, I looked at that big rock formation and I, I, for myself, I named it 10 mile rock. And, and so it was, that was a, a measurable, uh, goal to try and achieve is walk 10 miles in a day. Then I can finally stand on that rock. And little did I know that that would, that would be the first in a, in a long line of summits that would, that would come after it. But what it was was training in, and it wasn't, it wasn't just, it was life experience training in that, in that, you know, you can come from the hole at the bottom of a mountain to stand on top of a mountain again at some point. And so that was, that was a quantifiable goal that, that I set and, uh, achieved that in just three months of when I, when I first put the cane down, took the leg break, brace off and started walking again. That was my first goal, and, and I did achieve it in three months' time. And the more I walked, the more my brain learned to help me walk what appears to be normally, but I know is a completely different process than than what it was before Parkinson's. What about your posture? Because weren't you were you leaning or hunched over a little bit? Yeah, I mean, it's it basically I was, you know early forties and, and posture wise and the way that I walked and everything, it looked like a very old person, very stooped over and everything. But it was as, as the brain learned to redo these things, uh, I was able to at least appear to anyone else that, that I was walking normally and that I, you know, that the physical part wasn't so obvious to other people, you know, that it was like, under, it was one of the ways that I refer to it is, um, you know, most days I'm working undercover as a normal person, <laughs> you know, that, that I, I, I do the same things, but my brain had to learn to do it a different way. And I, I think that's true for a lot of people um, who've suffered a traumatic brain injury or, 
or uh, neurological disease that, that affects the brain, you you can learn to do these things again, but it's a different road. You know, there's more than one road to get to a destination, and you're basically having to take a different road. Mm-hmm. But what what that did was to help me be ready for when he came home, and and um, by the time he came home in uh, about six months after that phone call, um, he he barely recognized me because there was no cane and there was no leg brace, and I stood straight and weighed less and and could walk. Normally, you lost about a hundred pounds, didn't you? Yeah, yeah, that was what I gained over those eight years of of struggle. And so, you know, it was I looked like his dad that he knew from when he was a kid. Hmm. And you know, after he came home, he came home without any visible injuries. But like a lot of guys and gals that came home, the the invisible injuries, the you know, the, the stress, the survivor's guilt, you know, why, why did I make it when my buddy with two kids didn't, you know, so there was, there was a lot of things to deal with. And, and fortunately I was prepared by then to be able to help him. Yeah. Because y'all spent some time together. Yeah. I mean, we, we did some local hikes there in Birmingham, but what really set us off was when we took off to Colorado, um, to climb uh, Pikes Peak in the winter. You know, we, we didn't have any experience at high altitude, and, and so we're just taking off. We buy some cold-weather clothes and take off up the mountain, you know, which isn't very smart, but, you know, we were doing – we didn't know that at the time. You know, we're, we've trained a lot since then, so we know how naive we were at that point. But the, but the main thing about that day, you know, of course we didn't make it to the top uh, in that in winter because there was a, a winter storm at the top, but we did make it far enough for him to realize, you know, this is this is my line, this is my demarcation line between war and peace. And so, you know, from from that time when we when we came out here, um, it was really the beginning of recovery for him. And so, literally, I was physically prepared to walk, you know, to hike up a mountain with him. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and had I not been, would he have made it to that spot where he found his peace? You know, so the way God works is you, you never quite know exactly what's going on. But the best thing you can do is say, OK, you want me to go in that direction? I'll go. And, you know, part of it is, you know, a lot of times civilians think, you know, I can't really connect with a veteran or someone who's been to war. And a lot of times the person who's been to war feels like they have a hard time connecting with, with the civilian. But I think those of us, especially family who have been through our own struggles, there's, there is overlap. You know, I fought an eight year long battle. His was a seven month acute um, experience in combat. And even though he couldn't know my battle and I couldn't know his, the fact that we had both been through something that we had to overcome helped us to be able to work together to help each other. Yeah. And and Roger, um, when I met you in early 2012, well, I you know I, I drove into the neighborhood looking at a house and I passed you walking. You had a pack on, and to a lot of people, I know that you got strange looks, but I not for me because I knew what you were doing because I was doing the same, just kind of for different reasons. Mm-hmm. And um, so you stood out to me by the time we got to the house or walked out of the house, you were walking by in front of the house we were looking at. And so I just immediately started talking to you and asked, I think I asked you about your boots at the very first. But at that point, that was before you had gone to Colorado with your son, your oldest. Well, it was- and Right after we went to Colorado, but before we moved. Okay. Oh, you'd already gone out. All right. But and you had already you had long quit your meds too. Is that right? Yeah, I had I had quit them the fall before, and and for people who are familiar with that, it that hardly ever happens that someone with Parkinson's can can just stop taking their meds and continue to function uh, somewhat normally. 
but I just felt like there were too many side effects and I wanted to see what it was like to live with just the original problem. And it, it taught me a great deal of how to live on the, on the razor's edge. You know, okay, I need to eat this. I need to get this amount of exercise. I have to get this much rest. I have to learn how to handle stress. You know, all these things going into it and realizing that I do have a great deal of power in, in how it's dealt with. You know, and, and a lot of times it's like, you know, we're, although I do take meds again now, there was that three year period of time when, when I just learned about the disease and, and how to manage it on my own. What about your, I, I think you, you definitely did some trials or you figured out that if you didn't exercise or if you didn't walk a certain amount every week, you know, you you would shake and you definitely felt the effects. Is that right? What, what are the specifics there? I called it turning back into a pumpkin. It was, it was like as long as, as I was moving, I could stay, you know, several steps ahead of it. And as soon as I stopped moving, it would catch up. And so what I learned is that basically, unless they invent the magic pill that, that cures this, um, I'm essentially, uh, I have to move, I have to keep moving the rest of my life, you know, always to be in as much motion as possible. And if you stop and think about things, that's really not a bad spot to be in because the more we're in movement, I mean, our bodies were meant to move, we're, we're meant to walk, we're meant to um, endure. And so, you know, it's it turned out to be kind of a, a blessing in that regard in that, you know, I have a reason to keep moving. I can't get, I can't really get lazy. Um, you know, so at, at when, that point when we met, I was training for Baton, mm -hmm. a Memorial Death March in, in uh, New Mexico. It's every year since the late 80s. And uh, for those of you out there who don't know anything about it, uh, Google it, look it up. It's it's one of the most inspiring things you could ever be part of. Uh, when you see wounded uh, veterans and you see young enlisted personnel and, and old, you know, officers who are a day away from retirement and everybody in between that, that goes out there, and, you know, six, seven thousand people and, and makes this marathon linked hike in New Mexico to honor the, the people who who went through the Baton Death March. So, you know, that's a separate thing. You you guys can look that up and, and know it's a, it's a great thing to be part of. But in order to, to be able to do that, I had to train for quite some time to be able to, you know, to hike 26.2 miles through the desert with a, with a rock. And so you, I think when we have goals like that, like, training for something specific, um, it helps us and it gives us, uh, like we were talking about earlier, a quantifiable um, goal to work towards. And so at that point, too, you were training for uh, the memorial hike for your brother. Mm -hmm. And so we were, we were kind of in the same spot, even though, like you said earlier, we were doing it for different reasons, but we, it was a very similar goal. Yeah. Yeah, we did a lot of walking together yeah. that year, that spring, in yeah. the neighborhood, in the hills. And it's a hilly neighborhood, so it was good good practice for me anyway. So what 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 how did the how did Baton go? Because I think your oldest son went with you that year, didn't he? Yeah. He by then my younger son was in the Marine Corps and uh my older son was went with me and, and you know, we made it well and we and then he he had kind of a fluke hip injury. Uh, with about five or six miles left. And so literally it was like a, uh, it was like a reenactment of, of baton, you know, the arm around the shoulder, the my arm around his waist and, and basically walking together like a three legged race, you know, that you're, you're carrying walking with this person. And so in that instance, you know, me who had been physically crippled for years, and, you know, he's young and had been to war and, and combat and young and healthy. And and here I am helping to carry him. And so that was that was really a unique experience to know that, you know, we had progressed to this point to where when he physically needed help that that I could do that. You know, so it was it was a very rewarding um, 
day for us mm-hmm. together as father and son. And, uh, you know, just the other things we saw that day, it was, it was a really good, it was a really good experience for us. Mm, yeah. Flashback to when you had that impression of, of walking, you need to be, you need to be there for your son, whether you have to walk somewhere or, or just to be with him, you know, more metaphorically. And right. And, and, you know, I had done that the, the, the winter before, you know, a few months before in Colorado and then, you know, to be there with him, to help him get to that place that he needed to be. But also, you know, in, in March of 2012, you know, the following spring, that I had to physically help carry him to the end. And so, you know, that was, that was a great experience. I'm sure. What, how did he handle that? Was that tough for him or at first yeah, was he, it? He hobbled for a, for a couple of miles and then he finally said, you know, I'm not going to make it unless you help me. And, uh, you know, so obviously it was a little humbling for him, but I think also, um, just knowing that I was at a point again where I could help him in that way when he had seen me sick for so long, um, gave him some solace. Yeah. So you've accomplished a ton, I think, since your, definitely since your diagnosis and even since then. So what, what have you, you know, what events and I don't know, what all have you done? I, yeah, well, big question, but we can go through one by one if need be. Dropping back a little, a little bit to, uh, you know, you mentioned the book earlier. Um, the the title of the book is Push the Rock, Second Chances on the Road to Kilimanjaro. And uh, even though I go by Roger, I, I use an author name, and it's R.W. Long. And so that book basically came about as a result of um, getting on a team with uh, the Michael J. Fox Foundation um, to go to Kilimanjaro, or to go to Africa and climb Kilimanjaro to raise money for research. And, you know, I never knew when I first started, I mean, I couldn't have imagined when I first started walking again that, that someday it would lead me to climb the tallest mountain in Africa. And so that was later in the year after, after going to Bataan with my son. And we, we completely changed our lives in order to accomplish Kilimanjaro. I mean, we, we moved to Colorado, um, so I could train at altitude. And uh, Ben, my son, came with us. And uh, you know, it, being out here helped him find you know a great deal of of uh, peace in the wilderness. But it also allowed me to prepare to go to Kilimanjaro. And uh, so you know, my whole training regimen was to climb as many fourteen thousand foot mountains as I could. You know, that's the highest we can get here in the continental U.S. And there's the highest concentration of them here in Colorado. So I did learn quite a bit about um, uh, being at altitude, uh, what my body, you know, needed in the training and, you know, how I needed to respond. And I do know that had had, had we not moved here, um, I would have never made it to Africa. You know, I, I wouldn't have been ready. And so I did uh, with a, a team of 15 others. Um, I was the only one with Parkinson's. Everybody else was basically doing it for someone you know, in their family or a family friend. Uh, I did make it to the top of Kili, and it was the hardest physical thing I've ever done. You know, it's 19,341 feet. And uh, in addition to climbing the mountain, Africa changes a person. When, when you see a lot of people who don't really have anything compared to what Americans have, and you see that they're happy, uh, in their daily lives, it, it really, you know, shines a light on just how much we do have to be thankful for and, and to not take it for granted. And, uh, I think a lot of people who, uh, who've been deployed to some of these war zones, they come home feeling that uh, very, something very similar. Um, I know my son has told me about being, you know, after going to a, a very poor nation in Africa as part of his, uh, deployment. You know, just how fortunate he knows we are here. But going back to Kilimanjaro, apart from just the Africa experience, um, that did show me what's really possible, that that God can take somebody off the scrap heap and, and step by step rebuild our lives, show us how to rebuild our lives and how to how to think beyond ourselves, how to think 
of other people and, and you know it starts with family and uh hopefully for most people it starts with family and then it just ripples outward from there you know people in your community other people the other people that i consider part of my tribe you know other people with parkinson's you know how how can i help them and so that was really the the basis for the book in uh, in telling the story of of how you know, you go from this incredible low point to this incredible high point and, you know, the struggle and, and everything that's encompassed in that. All right. So, so describe the feeling of standing at the summit on the summit of Kilimanjaro. Well, you know, about a thousand feet below the summit is when we got to witness sunrise at about 18,000 feet. And so when you, when you witness sunrise above the clouds, not in an airplane, you know, we, I think a lot of us have seen a sunrise being in an airplane and you're above the clouds. But when you, when you fought for months to be able to get to that point on your own two feet, you know, to reach that point where you're standing on and you're touching earth and you're, but you're actually above the clouds and you see sunrise, you know, that's, that's indelible. That's printed on my brain forever. And then that last thousand feet, you know, to get to the summit, you know, took another few hours and that was very difficult. But once you finally get there, you know, you're, you're looking out in, in this vast expanse of sky and clouds, but you also feel a sense of uh, claustrophobia because there's only about 50% of the air, you know, the oxygen that you're accustomed to having. So even though you're out in the wide open, you, you do feel a little claustrophobic because it's just so hard to breathe. But that aside, you know, it was, you know, over a course of five days, we'd went from the African savanna through the rainforest through two or three other, uh, climate zones to get to the glacial zone and, and to lay eyes on a real glacier, you know, in, in this, in Africa, just a couple hours south of the equator. It was really a unique experience. I know that y'all lost a teammate. She actually died there and, yeah. um, she died in a hospital in, in, one of the local cities. Mm-hmm. And I, that's, go ahead. Well, we don't, you know, obviously I haven't seen her autopsy, but from everything that we were able to gather, it was high altitude pulmonary edema. So altitude is not something to, to take lightly, you know, so there is risk involved. And that's one of the things that if anybody asks me, you know, about what's it like to climb Achille, I'm like, one of the things you have to understand is anytime you're at altitude, there is a risk involved. Yeah. What were the, what unexpected did you encounter? You know, was there like gear, equipment? Did you, you know, a sickness? Uh, I don't know, something you weren't even prepared for? Um, I think unexpected is just out of, the, out of the blue one day, the second half of the day that basically I turned back into a pumpkin. And, and we still had several miles to go and it took four or five team members to help me descend down this really rocky uh, terrain to get to camp. Because when you're climbing Kili, essentially after the first day, you go up and then back down. To a, it's like taking two steps up and a half a step back down in order to uh, adjust, to acclimatize. So it's climb high, sleep low. And so we had already reached the high point of that day, and it was it was a little stressful, but it was really fun. But then the coming back down, I guess, I just taxed my system to the point where, you know, the Parkinson's caught up with me. So having teammates and one of the African guides helping me navigate this really rocky terrain to get back down to camp took probably two or three times longer than it would have, than it should have. So we got in late after dark and everything. And I, you know, I'm thinking that, you know, I'm, I might be done. But fortunately when I woke the next day, I was able to move again and, and, keep going. But uh, from then on, I had to be really cognizant of, you know, am, am I getting enough rest? Am I getting enough water? Am I, am, you know, paying real close attention to, and, and at that time I wasn't taking meds. So I had to adjust to, uh, you know, how do I make this happen? And, and so from then on, it was, it was a little more precarious, you know, trying to, not only do the mountain, but to, to fight the, the battle within. Mm-hmm. 
what specifically was your motivation while you were out there and especially when it was difficult and not just for you but for everyone in your group what was it was there any particular you know i, I don't know mantra anything in particular that you kept going back to to motivate you well i mean i, I wanted to do it for my family and um, i think one of the very sh- strongest pulls was to to do it to show other people who were struggling like i did for those eight years that, that you know this is possible that that they they wouldn't believe it unless they saw it you know because i didn't know if i believed it until i did it and so it a lot of that motivation was to show them what they're capable of not not hey look at me i climbed this mountain but like i i'm i'm setting a, a trail you know for others to to show them that you know this is possible for you too and you were 46 years old yeah right and were you by far the oldest one in your group yeah by at least five years okay and and then after that it was everybody else was in their 20s or 30s okay so what has your life been like since then and what else have you done and, and i mean what else do you want to say about the book too because i've read the book i read it right when it came out it's an excellent book it's a great book that i recommend to gift people as well um because it's you know you it's not just for somebody struggling with parkinson's i mean it, it applies to everybody because we all have opposition yeah i mean uh, it's, it's a story of overcoming yeah it's a story of love you know what what we're capable of doing when motivated by love and you know first for my family and for my son and and then you know that kind of love it's almost like a nuclear reaction it just keeps growing and you, you want to spread that and be able to to offer that love to other people and, and offer help and inspiration to other people. And so that, that's a lot of what this, the story is. Um, but it's also a story of faith. You know, I'm not, I'm not preachy, but I'm not bashful about, about my faith and how it affects everything we do. And so, it, you know, there's a, you know, there's obviously the, the military element, the, the family element. You know, struggle you know, that that we all have some story. We all have our own struggle, and that I think most people, the feedback that I've gotten is people like I may not have lived your exact experience, but I understand what my struggle has been like. And so I think that resonates with people, and and they can connect with that. That that hey, you know, somebody else has been through a, a tough time too, and they made it. You know. I made it, they made it, you know, or hopefully they made it and, and hopefully I can too. You know, so that was the real purpose was to be able to lift other people up and, and the purpose in writing it. And it was over the course of three years, um, writing it and going through the publishing process. And that was, uh, and I know you know this as well, that writing the book was harder than just about anything else we've ever done. You know, because you, you have to be transparent. You have to be honest. You have to be real. And uh, a lot of times we don't want to expose ourselves to other people in that way. But, you know, it came down in the end. The, the motivation to finish it was if this helps one person. And I think if we carry that forward with us, like whatever we do, you know, the, it doesn't have to help a thousand people to be worthy of doing. If it helps one person with their struggle, then our effort is worth it. Yep. And, and I think audiences want that. They want to, they appreciate the, the vulnerability that they see in the, you know, in the author or the host, you know, whether it's a podcast, a book or whatever. I mean, when, when, when that person opens up and shares their weaknesses and vulnerabilities, that's, I think the, you know, the audience can, can connect better and trust Trust them more. Yeah. Well, and people know if they're being played. You know, if you write a book specifically to entertain a certain audience, you know, people outside that audience understand, you know, this this is catering to a specific group of people. Okay. But if you if you learn to just be real and be yourself and say, I'm going to be true to my own story in telling it and it goes where it goes, you know, it people, I think, appreciate real. 
because so much of what we see in everyday life anymore, we're not really sure we can trust it. Yeah. You know, so yeah. when you're hearing or reading something coming from someone and, and you're like, I'm, I'm being as real as I can be here, folks, you know, that in telling this story, then I think people resonate with that, even though they might not be, you know, they may not have anything to do with Parkinson's or military or whatever. The, the honesty and the realness of it, I think, impacts people. Yeah, I agree with you a hundred percent. And, and now the book is, is like my third child. You know, you, you do something and you set it free on the world and you hope it does good. And, uh, you know, when I do get feedback from time to time from people, it's kind of like, yeah, every minute of that three years was worth it. Yes. This one person, you know, it resonated with them. They got some type of benefit from it. That, that I'd like to add to you that what one thing that does is there's so many people, veterans, family members of, of military who have such incredible stories that, that are worth telling. And that if, if they've ever wondered about, you know, is, is my, you know, I'm just a regular person, you know, who cares about my story? You, you got to think that there's, there's at least one person out there that, that if you tell your story, it's going to get a benefit from it. Yeah, because not all these guys have major motion pictures made about it, their stories. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, there's and that's the purpose of my podcast is there's so many people, you know, a lot of my guests, actually, I guess the majority of mine aren't household names. <laughs> and that's good. Mm-hmm. But they have they are incredibly committed to freedom. You know, and and patriots, and you know, to serving others, you know, like you. I appreciate that. W- what is next for you, Roger? Are you going back to Europe? Yeah. Um. Since one of the other things I've done since Kilimanjaro is is uh, I've been twice to Spain uh, on the Camino de Santiago, which is a, a thousand plus year old pilgrimage trail that starts in France and goes across northern Spain to Santiago de Compostela. Uh, where the remains of St. James are interred. And, and it's, it's more than just a, a religious pilgrimage. There's last year, there were almost 300,000 people who, uh, who walk the paths to get to Santiago. And, uh, it's rare that we get an opportunity to be in a culture where everybody's moving in the same direction with a common purpose. And I think a lot of people who've been in the military and a lot of other people who've been part of an elite group realize that's something that we don't get to experience very often. And so I've been twice, once as a caregiver the first time I went. And uh, last year I went with my younger son after he got out of the Marine Corps. And uh, next year I'm going back by myself this time. And I'm going to walk a different path, but still reach the same destination. And so just to, you know, there's no real purpose other than just to be, just to the experience of, of being part of this group of people from all over the world that come and, sh- and share this experience of walking 500 miles across Spain. How long did it take you when you and your youngest did it? Well, about five weeks. Okay. I and, completely forgot about that. That's yeah, and awesome. Then, See, and then we had, uh, the time. we had a couple weeks vacation afterwards. We visited Portugal and then Barcelona and then France and, and uh, went to the devil dog fountain and all that kind of good stuff afterwards. You know, so we, that was a really good experience to have to help him not only as a father son thing, but to help his transition out of the military and into the civilian world. Um, but this next time I think is if that's my mission field, if that's where I'm supposed to go to meet people and to have a positive influence, then I'll walk across Spain again. And so I, the way that I, my life is different now than it was before Parkinson's is it's, it's much more instead of, you know, chasing the American dream and I got to have this house and this car. It's, you know, in my five year plan and my 10 year plan. Now it's like, you know, what am I going to do today? What am I going to do next week or, or in the next few months to uh, have a positive influence? It's not about stuff. It's about experiences and about, you know, reaching other people, you know, and, and caring for them and having a positive influence. And, and so in the, in the big picture, um, even though Parkinson's is not easy, uh, it's turned out to really shape me 
and shape my life into what it was really meant to be. Wow. What else? Anything else on the horizon? Uh, my wife and I are going to Israel in May to uh, follow Christ ministry. So that'll be cool. And, and so now it's just um, you know, trying to have some good experiences. It's like I said, it's not about stuff. It's just work, you know, save the money and, and then go somewhere and, and be useful. Yeah. When are you going to uh, mention your next project or announce that? Well, I haven't really, even though we talked about it back in uh, the summer, I haven't really had a time to had the time to start on it yet. But essentially, my uh, my uh, neurologist and I are going to work on a book together, collecting stories of other people who have who have PD, who have run marathons or biked across the country or climbed mountains or whatever um, that put this book of stories together. It'll be a free resource to the newly diagnosed or the recently diagnosed to let them know that, Hey, you know, it's not a death sentence. You can still get out there and do stuff. You can still live. Yeah. Yeah. That'll be great. Uh, and one last question. I wanted to ask you something concerning gear. Mm. What, boots what footwear do you wear when you're doing especially like the the camino you know over in europe what are you wearing well it's solomon boots okay are you wearing those when you're in the mountains in colorado as well yeah, yeah. I've, okay. I've tried several different things and finally went to them they're really light and tough and so that's what i work with now okay well you you have some good gear or you used to. I remember you stocked up here before you left and then I'm sure yeah. you've added to it quite a bit since yeah. you've been out in the Rockies as well. Yeah, here's a lot of you gotta make sure you got the right cold gear and layer and everything. And then when you're when you're walking across the country you have to have or do an Appalachian trail or anything like that, you have to start looking at lightweight gear. You know, weight becomes an issue. And uh so you wanna be as light on your feet as you can. Yeah, you introduced me to some La Sportivas several years ago, and I actually still have them, and I've been wearing them ever since. Uh, they're, uh, I've worn them every year for the walk, except I think the first two mm. or three years. But anyway, they're doing pretty dang good. Yeah, I, did, I wore those the first time I went to Camino, and, and they uh, they didn't hold up over the whole trip, but you know they were pretty comfortable while they while they were still intact. So Roger, guess, anything in clothing? Sorry, go ahead. I guess day in and day out, wet, dry, and everything, it, it wasn't, you know, they weren't the best for that task that I was doing. Okay. Well, I appreciate you. Really appreciate your time and your motive, your, uh, I don't know, your inspiration and anything you'd like to share with us in closing? Um, no, I just appreciate you having me on. And um, if anybody, uh, wants to know more or know how to reach me, um, you can go to firstsummitproject.org and uh, there's a contact form there. And if there's any way that I can help someone, I'd be more than happy to do my best to try and help. Is that is first spelled out or is it yes. the one? Okay, yep. it's spelled out. Yeah, no no spaces, just firstsummitproject.org. Okay, good. I'll have that linked in the show notes. I'll have a link to your book. Do you want me to, to link it to Amazon or where? Yeah. Well, I mean, it's on it's on both. You can link it to Amazon, or it's, there's also a, a link to it on on the website. Okay. Okay, and uh, folks, if you've enjoyed uh, hearing from Roger, please yeah, reach out to him. What about social media? Are you active? You know, on Facebook or Twitter or Instagram? Yeah, my Facebook is pretty much private, but on Twitter it's Ten Mile Rock. You know, uh, the number Ten Mile Rock, and the same thing on Instagram. Um, I've posted a lot of photos on Instagram from Europe and from Kilimanjaro. So there's that if people want to take a look at the photos. Okay. Yeah, I'll put some, I'll put those links in there. So appreciate it. Thank you very much. And this will be a great, um, I don't know, it's a, a motivating episode. And, and, and if people like it, then please just go and rate the podcast. Uh, you can do it very easily now with a new iOS update on your iPhones anyway. I'm not sure about the other the other um, operating systems. But anyway, the iOS, it's very easy to, to rate a podcast now. I appreciate Apple Podcasts finally changing that because I, 
I couldn't de describe to people how to rate it before without getting on a computer. Now you can do it from your phone very easily. All right, till next time.